There's no easy way to say this, CJ. Um, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, probably not a good football team this year. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a lot of hope for the future starting in 2024 and beyond. Uh, it's a very similar situation to the Chicago Bears of 2022. They're, they're probably going to take it on the chin this year a little bit. I don't think they're going to be dreadful, uh, but they probably won't be very good. And it is what it is. They got a ring out of the, the bed that they made. I'm sure Bucks fans are very happy about that. And right now they're in the process of putting themselves in a position to maybe be able to be a contending team again within a few years. But uh, yeah, it seems like in recent NFL history, these are the types of seasons that are the cost of winning a Super Bowl. Yeah, it's the full swing. They're not going to be dreadful because the defense has the potential to be really, really good on offense. They might hold their own, but <laughs> we're hoping for 17 points. Yeah, that's, that's what we're it, hoping for. It comes down to quarterbacking. And yes, this is the cost of climbing the mountain. And then this is this is the valley. Well, we have a lot to go over today. Uh, all the roster moves, all the coaching changes, the, the draft picks that we like, uh, the free agency necessities to put it a <laughs> diplomatic way. There's a lot of things to go over. We're going to be talking about the 2023 Tampa Bay Buccaneers and everything that comes with that beautiful disaster. Jay, Autumn, Anthony, whoever happens to be editing this episode, roll the intro. So the Bucks were eight and nine last year. Um, is it just me or did it not feel like an eight and nine season? Like there's a lot of teams that would kill for eight and nine. Uh, the Bucks felt like they just had to scratch and claw and fight their way to almost be a 500 football team. I don't know. It it felt like the most difficult eight and nine season in a while. Felt like they tried to lose more of those games than that. Uh, Overall record, eight and nine, losing record, but first in the division. That is a rarity to win a division with a losing record. Home record, five and four, road record, three and five. Last five games, two and three. And I think that's probably the most representative piece of this whole team. They just were up and down all year. They struggled a lot. We're going to talk about it. Injury is a big part, especially to the offensive line. That was reflected in a lot of their rankings, but they just couldn't get on a roll luckily luckily for them the rest of their division couldn't either I think it was uh Jensen went down what like two days into camp yeah like super early and that was if there was ever foreshadowing for an NFL season that was it yeah it was just a tough year and it was it was supposed to be you know the final last ride of Tom Brady they got the band back together most of the Super Bowl winning structure was still in place uh, obviously uh new head coach because Arians uh, was on a, I don't know what role, what role do they even consider Arians? It's like a front office role, but they never really specified exactly what he's doing. Professor Emeritus. <laughs> but you know, mo most of the boys were there, right? And it just, it, they couldn't stay healthy. And I feel like there was a disconnect um, between Byron and Tom. Uh, again, we, I don't know if we're ever going to know the full story of what was going on there. It just, it was a lost season. There's no other way to put it. Uh, and yet, because the NFC South is so bad, they still won the division. Came in first overall. Uh, that was really the only thing they were first in was their very own division. If we talk about their effectiveness summary for the year, we break this down using EPA per play as the main sort of backbone stat. We talk about rushing offense, passing offense rush defense, pass defense, and then, of course, points scored and points allowed. For rushing offense, this one, again, is directly a sort of trickle down or or splash down from the Ryan Jensen in his, uh, injury. But the rushing offense was 32nd in the league. Yeah. And that is never a good thing when you're bringing up the rear. Uh, and it's not a position that they found themselves in. They've been a very solid rushing attack. And so to drop all the way to the bottom of the table – is something that just crippled them in their offense. They never could lean on that. They had to throw. Everybody knew it, and that didn't work out for them. Passing offense, middle of the road, 15. Very good league rank, good enough to win. Rush defense, and here's the sort of glimmer of hope for the future. Fifth. 
Well, they've always been a great run defense. I feel like if we went back and looked at their EPA per play finishes and run defense, I'd bet they're top five every year for the last five years. Yeah, certainly top 10. And they maintained that rank and they've added some playmakers to that. We're going to talk about that as we get to the free agency and certainly the draft portions of this particular show. But a very good rank there. And pass defense, they were solid as well, 13th in the league overall. So besides the rushing offense, which, again, it doesn't have to be great, but it needs to not be terrible. And it was terrible. They were an average football team. They were right down the middle. And that's reflected in their record and the way they ended up overall. In the year, points scored, 313, only good enough for 25th. And that is a reason that they couldn't get over the hump and become a positive plus win football team. Points allowed, 358. That was good for 13th. So they were good scoring defense. They were good defense overall, but they were also a good scoring defense. If you take all those numbers for their league ranks, add them up, divide by six, they end up with bootleg power score of 17. And that is good enough for 15th overall as we stacked them in the NFL. Again, right down the middle. They were an 8-9 and nine team. They had a power score that reflected that. Feels like it all added up, but they were a frustrating team to watch. It never felt like they were going to just come out and thrash somebody. Like, any of those wins were guaranteed. They started mid, they stayed mid, and they finished mid. Like, the entire year was just... You were waiting for them to turn it on like they did in 2020, right? Where they hit the bye week, and like, they were painfully average in 2020 before the bye week and then they hit the bye week and all of a sudden Tom was like okay guys we need to stop screwing around here and they didn't lose again for the rest of the year right uh it it was not the case like they just could never quite turn it on and I know injuries played a big factor in that um if we look at the scheme stats and a lot of especially the passing stats that kind of give a lot of context to the EPA numbers you just listed Uh, Because you did say they were 15th in EPA per play in the passing game, despite their offensive line being extremely banged up. And the banged up offensive line is a a big explainer for why the run game was so bad. Mm -hmm. Um, But if you look at Tom's average time to throw, 2.36 seconds, that was first by a landslide. Uh, Burrow and T-Law were each tied at second, and they were, I mean, I don't want to say slower, but like relative to Tom, it was like, two tenths of a second slower. Uh, And so he was getting it out immediately um, and doing Tom Brady things, you know, being accurate, throwing on time, throwing it with anticipation and, and basically carrying the pass game with decision-making and accuracy. Uh, They were not as explosive as we were used to seeing from them. Um, But, you know, with that, again, with that banged up offensive line, I didn't really (laughs) expect them to be, Uh, you know, you look at, Um, average depth of target, 8.2 yards. That was 23rd. Uh, You compare that to earlier in the Tom Brady regime in Tampa where they were throwing bombs to Scotty Miller every single week. Like it was, it was definitely a change. There was not as much deep ball uh, presence there. Air yards percentage, the percentage of their passing yards that came through the air uh, other than after the catch, it was 23rd. So uh, more than 50% of their yards were after the catch. Um, play action percentage, 16.1%. They, they couldn't run the ball. So they stopped trying to run the ball. And when they stopped trying to run the ball, they didn't even mess around with play action. Like they just, they straight up didn't use it. And, uh, I also happened to, or I have a theory that <laughs> Tom was like, I literally can't waste time on play fakes guys. I have to get it out or I will die. So they just, they didn't do it. Let's just cut that part. <laughs> just straight up didn't do it. Uh, and overall, all these stats led to a yards per attempt of seven, which was 20th. Um, it's I empathize heavily with everybody on that Bucks offense last year because you can have great receivers. You can have, you know, Evans and Godwin and uh, you can have a young, exciting running back like Rashad White, who they took far too long in the year to give him the ball. And you can have the greatest football player of all time throwing the ball. But if your offensive line isn't right, you're dead in the water anyway. Still a team game. We talk so much about how important the quarterback position, and it is. There's no getting around that. In fact, 2023 bucks are going to run into that. I think you're going to see that sort of laid bare on the field this year. But to your point, line play is still important. Bucks have a very good defensive line. They have a very good offensive line when healthy. 
They weren't healthy last year. They had a bunch of holes and they had to adapt everything they tried to do to play within that envelope. And it was a very narrow window. And you're not going to hit that all the time, especially when opposing teams coming in know that that's the deal, right? They can't run the ball. We're not going to see a lot of play action. You're almost being able to tee off from the very first down. And Brady was a lot of things. He was not super mobile. He was, I think, more mobile than most quarterbacks his age. But it wasn't enough to string it all together. And that's what you started to see through the middle of the season and then down the stretch was they just couldn't hook enough plays together inside that very narrow envelope to overcome the loss of what had been a real stalwart unit in their offensive line, specifically with Ryan Jensen leading the charge. Focusing in specifically on the run game, because we do have a, a new OC in town, Dave Canales, who came in from Seattle. Uh, you know, he worked under Waldron. He was the passing game coordinator, uh, there. And so I, I have to imagine there's a, a lot of Waldron and therefore McVeigh and therefore uh, Shanahan influences throughout all the different branches of that tree or like five layers deep on that tree at this point. But um, looking at who the starting quarterback is, Baker Mayfield, and who the OC is, I have to think there's going to be major changes coming to the run scheme. Because last year, they were 31st in outside zone, uh, and they were heavy on duo. They were second in duo. They were ninth in power. They were third in counter. It was very much like a uh, late 2000s, early 2010s Patriots run scheme of we are getting north-south. We are not making Tom have to you know, move that much, right? To like We are just getting vertical with the ground game. Uh, but... Baker has always excelled in, you know, in offenses when he does excel. He's excelled in offenses that have a lot of outside zone where he can boot and he can get in space and he can throw on the run because that's what he's good at. Like he's always been good at that. And, uh, you know, that's that's what Seattle does a lot of. So I have to think that they're going to be more than 8% outside zone this year, especially if we're really leaning into the Rashad White experience because he's good in outside zone. Baker's great in offenses that specialize in that. That's where their offensive coordinator comes in. I would bet this run scheme looks a lot more like Seattle and Cleveland and San Francisco than New England. It'll be fascinating to see. In fact, it's one of the most interesting nuggets on this team because they divide it between Canales, who's the OC, but their assistant head coach and run game coordinator is Harold Gowan. Yeah. And he's a carryover. But as you said, the talent's not the same. And that even stretches to their draft picks. We'll get to this when we talk about who they drafted, but they drafted a very mobile offensive lineman. They have a back that is better suited for outside zone. They have a quarterback Uh, at least ostensibly a starting quarterback (laughs) who is better on the move and outside and is familiar with those schemes and concepts. And they have a new OC whose sort of philosophy or tree, if you will, is, is also rooted in those. So like all the winds are blowing that way, except for the run game coach. So is he going to adapt and adjust? If he does, we could see a very different bucks, run game, very effective based on the personnel they have, or at least on paper, could be very effective. They've assembled the right pieces. It's not a square peg round hole thing. They have the right folks in the building to run it. We'll see how much they do. Switching over to the defensive side now, which has largely remained the same. There's a a little, like minor little bit of shuffling in personnel, but um, it's mostly the same. Like the core is mostly there. Uh, And I, I want to preface this by saying that the coverage information I'm about to read off and the blitz percentages I'm about to read off are heavily intertwined. And we've had a few teams like this where when you see uh, like huge spikes in cover three, but also huge spikes in blitz rates, uh, that's because they're playing a lot of fire zone coverages, which are marked in the database that we're using as cover three because it's three deep, three underneath, but there's five rushers. So it's it's, it's cover three zone, but with an extra guy rushing. So uh, keep that in mind. That's that's why their percentages are that way. But they were fifth overall in cover three because the, the fire zone calls, especially on third downs, 
are mixed in with the regular cover three calls on early downs. They were 13th in cover two. They were 22nd in cover one, did not play a whole lot of man coverage. Uh, They were 14th in zero. So when they really wanted to bring heat, they called zero. Not surprising for Todd Bowles. They were 19th in quarters. They were 22nd in quarter, quarter, half. And in cover five, also known as two man, they were ninth, uh, which ninth is like 2%. So again, not a whole lot. (laughs) Uh, Overall, this defense, if you look at like down by down, it was cover three on first down. We're going to stop the run. That's why their run game EPA is so damn good every year because not only do they have really good personnel right up the middle in terms of their linebackers and and defensive tackles, but also they're not afraid to throw a safety down in the box and and say, we got a guy for every single gap. Go ahead, try to win. You're probably not going to. So when they get you into second and eight, that's when they call cover two. Uh, and then when they get you into third down, that's when they call fire zone. So it's it's a very, I don't want to say predictable, cyclical <laughs> defense, but it works pretty darn well. Feels like they have presets, and the presets work. Folks understand the scheme. They have invested heavily in the draft. If you look at their front seven, this is a very good front seven, and it's for a reason. You look right down Right down the front three, Logan Hall, Vita Vea, Kalaji Kansi projected as a starter, all high round picks. Mm-hmm. You get into the linebacking core, Joe Tryon, Trinka, Devin White, Levante David, Shaq Barrett. Like not all necessarily high round picks, but uh, Damn highly, good players. <laughs> highly paid in free agency, if you want to say. These, these are all purpose built and purpose grabbed players to build a core that is extremely good. And then they match that with very physical defensive backs who will get up in your face, who have size at the corner position, who will come down and hit you, the Antoine Winfields of the world. Um, They always, you know, they had Jordan Whitehead for years. Like, they have guys that love that style, Mm -hmm. right? They are going to try and put a cap on you on first down, make sure that run goes nowhere. It's going to be a very physical game. And this is really where I get hope for this team is not only their performance last year in a down year was still very good basically a top 10 defense all the way across it's that they invested even more (laughs) they haven't lost any coaching necessarily on the defensive side and that can it's not going to win you games but it's going to carry you in games and keep you in games and this team's going to need that until they find their footing on offense. We talked about the shift in the rushing philosophy, obviously a shift at the quarterback position. Until they figure out what works and gets rolling, this defense can keep a cap on other team scoring. They can yeah. keep them in games with all that talent and that very aggressive physical scheme that we've seen from them. This is where I get, if I get at all excited about the 2023 bucks, and I say that with tempered enthusiasm, this is where it happens. I look at this side of the ball and go, these guys could be really good right out of the gate. Even if they go 5 and 12, the 12 losses like they're not going to get blown out. No. They, they might should. <laughs> It'll be very again similar to the Bears where they had what 10 of their losses were 7 points or less. Like they'll be entertaining bad. They're not going to be like, "Oh my god, I physically cannot watch this bad." <laughs> well, it might be for fans of a team that recently won the Super Bowl. It's not going to be that. Yeah, they're used to it. They're used to it. <laughs> they're Bucks fans. They're used to it. <laughs> Uh, by the way, for the record, because I remembered or I, I forgot uh, that I, I didn't read these uh, these numbers off the blitz percentages that I referenced. Uh, this is this should be uh, expected for a Todd Poles defense, but they were third in blitz rate on third and short at 67 percent. They were first in blitz rate on third and medium at about 61 percent, which is insane we've gone over a lot of defenses were like oh my god they were they were blitzing 50 percent. that's nuts like no todd bowles blitzed a hell of a lot more than that he's first by a lot uh and then third and long they were 17th in blitz rate at 35 percent, so roughly average and their overall stunt percentage on third down was about 40 percent, so about 20th or 39 percent. excuse me so uh again especially in third and medium between third third and three and third and six like they were sending pressure all the damn time. Um, And yeah, again, emphasizing what you were saying, the defense was good. It will keep them in games. The whole thing, the whole house of cards is built on 
the one card at the bottom, which is quarterback. If Baker somehow resurrects his career in Tampa, they'll be fine. Honestly, they'll be fine. Sure. Um, if Baker plays like Baker has played in the last few years, uh, you know, we might be looking at Caleb Williams being a buck in a couple of years here. Only if they're quote unquote lucky. Uh, I think the sort of, I don't want to say the curse, the reality of Baker Mayfield is pretty well established at this point. And he's going to give you some games. Absolutely. We saw him, you know, come into this town in Los Angeles on very short notice, uh, you know, like a, a week. day. Not, yeah, yeah. I mean, he had a <laughs> week of total communication and, and you know, not even full days of practice. They were just sort of drawing stuff up and going, you know how to run that, right? He was like, yeah. And gave us one of the most entertaining games of the season. Like he still has that potential. He has that capacity and we will see those sparks. This offense is good enough around him, especially healthy. He's going to have games like that and people are going to go, ha ha, we told you. And then he's going to revert because that's also what Baker Mayfield does. He's always had these highs and lows. He is the definition of a streaky shooter. Modern day Ryan Fitzpatrick. You know, it feels that way in a lot yeah. of ways. I think they, they have similarities and differences as players. But if you look at their overall sort of arc and they are what they are, especially late in their career, and that will continue to play, they will continue to get jobs. Yeah, there's a lot of similarity there. Zooming in on the coaching staff now, we've talked uh, a little bit about these guys so far, especially uh, new offense coordinator Dave Canales. Mentioned Harold Goodwin, mentioned uh, Larry Foote a little bit, but uh, I kind of want to take a top-down view of the power structure at large here. I don't necessarily feel like it's a bad coaching staff. I, I individually like all of these coaches. It just feels like somehow ever since, you know, Bruce Arians stepped away or stepped down, Whatever the story was behind that, I can, yeah. I'm not entirely sure what, what happened there. It feels like the cohesion hasn't been the same, even though individually all of these coaches, I, I do believe, are very good. I love that word. That's, I think, a finer point than I was going to be able to put on it. Cohesion or cohesiveness between all these good parts has not felt like they're all pulling in the same direction in the same way they did. And that maybe something that's just not replicable without Arians in the building. Cause that was one of his real strengths as a coach mm -hmm. was that piece of him being a people person of him being able to both identify talent and then get that talent to relate and work together and really believe uh, to, you know, grab a Ted Lasso phrase. That was, that was his superpower as a coach. And it, the vacuum of that definitely Feels felt mm -hmm. in his absence. Um, GM remains the same. Jason Light going into year nine. Todd Bowles, the handpicked successor by Arians to sort of graduate into that role uh, when Arians stepped on. Uh, coordinators, this is another one of those teams with the assistant head coach title. The secondary title there is offensive run game coordinator. That's Harold Goodwin. The OC, Dave Canales, we've mentioned him. Now, they sort of have co-DCs as well. Uh, one is the defensive run game coordinator and defensive line coach. That's Casey Rogers. And then the other is the defensive pass game coordinator and inside linebacker coach, and that's Larry Foote, who longtime NFL watchers will remember from his playing career as an inside linebacker. Special teams coach Keith Armstrong. So again, lots of experience, and this staff was very diverse uh, both in experience, age, uh, where folks had come from, where they had coached. Arians was sort of very agnostic about where people came from. He mm -hmm. cared very much whether or not you could coach, and he assembled a lot of them. He This staff was huge under Arians. I remember paging through it a couple of years ago when he did this and being like, God, how many, how many coaches and advisors and coordinators and analysts are on this staff? And there were a lot, and he wanted to open that door. So – there's this big, diverse, talented group of people. They're not short on know-how. It's getting them, you know, it's like making soup, right? It's mm -hmm. like getting all the parts to work together. And that's the real challenge for Bowles. If he can do it this year, 
again, this team could be very good. It has good enough players, certainly has a good enough coaching staff. It's about whether or not you can make the magic in that mix. And they it definitely didn't feel like that was happening last year. You mentioned the the difference in ages that he'll have uh, on his that Arians will have on his staffs. And, and Bulls, I think, is no different because on offense alone, you've got Tom Moore, who's been around for decade after decade after decade after decade, but also Thad Lewis, yeah. young quarterback coach there. So it, it's it's kind of a converging of two generations that are also two generations apart themselves. Yeah, Tom Moore uh, is just assistant coach. That's literally it's his just, title. It's not go, assistant, go, go fix stuff, Tom. It's not assistant head coach or assistant <laughs> offensive coach or assistant quarterback coach. It's just assistant coach, which I found fascinating. But he is a guy that kind of writes his own ticket. Like if he agrees to come work for you, you're like, do your thing. Just you know what you're doing. He's entering his 43rd season as an NFL coach. Not his 43rd season of coaching. His 43rd season of NFL coaching. Mm -hmm. That's nuts mm -hmm. like that alone is crazy he's coached a multitude of hall of fame players because if we list all the players he coached that would be the entire episode <laughs> just <laughs> hall of fame players that he's coached peyton manning lynn swan john stallworth terry bradshaw franco harris mike webster barry sanders marshall falk randall mcdaniel chris carter marvin harrison edron james and of course brady when he goes in is this why you looked up it the is. Randall McDaniel combine? It is. <laughs> tell, tell the folks about that, by the way, because so he I, was so giddy this morning. I about put this. out a tweet today. I, I, I'll do this as a longtime watcher of the league. I will see a name that I haven't thought about in a while. And I saw Randall McDaniel on that list. And I was like, Randall McDaniel. God, I haven't thought about him. Yeah, you know, Hall of Fame guard was drafted by the Vikings, ended up playing for the Bucks eventually in a, in a fun turn. But I was like, man. And so I looked him up. I was like, when did he when did he start? OK, he was in the 87 Rose Bowl. And then it mentions that in high school, he ran a 10, 600 meters at like 265 pounds in the early 80s when training was not the same. It, it was a whole different world at that point. And he was he was a lighter guard, uh, which in those days was even more rare. And there was some question about whether or not he could hold up against all the monsters in the league. I mean, there were defensive tackles at 330 at the time and that was not uncommon um but i had no idea he was that fast he was track and field athlete at the time but yeah um randall mcdaniel great throwback and then you just go look something up and you're like freak for all those people <laughs> that are like oh yeah i could gain 10 yards in the nfl it's like maybe if you were following randall mcdaniel but the problem <laughs> is the guy across from randall mcdaniel is an equal you know level mutant so good luck with that these are these are not you know average athletes yeah in, go in ahead run stretch. it run it randy white see what happens <laughs> yeah so and thaddeus lewis you mentioned as well he's gonna have his hands full trying to maximize baker uh baker's been playing long enough in this league uh and has enough experience under enough different coaches and different systems that i'm sure he is open to coaching but he is also pretty sure of what he knows and what he thinks he does best and getting him to move away from that certainly on the on the points of weakness uh, that we mentioned earlier is a challenge. So Thaddeus Lewis, you know, if he can make that work, if he can make that relationship work with Baker, this team could be decent. Um, so Thad Lewis, for those of you that don't know, was a quarterback at Duke and set records for career passing yards and TDs. That's when he left. He held those records at Duke. Um, played seven seasons in the NFL for nine total teams on his own right. So he understands, and maybe that will help him relate to Baker. Hey, I bounced around as well. Hey, I played for a lot of coaches, experienced a lot of different things. Let me help you out. Let me round some of these uh, rougher edges off your game. And who knows, that could work. On defense, uh, notable coach Kevin Ross is the cornerbacks coach. Um, Tampa Bay defensive backs had 14 different starting lineups in 17 games last year. That's uh, did any other team beat that? Probably not. I don't think so. And it was all due to injuries. Now, Ross was a 14 year NFL veteran and two time pro bowler. Uh, and he's in the Chiefs Hall of Fame uh, as well. So if you recognize the name, that's where from. Again, no shortage of experience in these coaches. Uh, we'll see if they can all get some very talented athletes on both sides of the ball to pull together early in the year. And if they do, Tampa Bay could surprise early on. 
I don't think that'll continue overall. But if it does, this is the basis where it's going to come from. Taking all of that information into account, um, zooming in specifically on Baker and his weapons, I do... Oh, God. Brett, <laughs> Brett you're getting yourself into trouble again. <sighs> okay, That's every episode. I'm not saying he's going to be a top quarterback, but I do think that Baker at QB 33 right now, mm. with... It, 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 again, offensive line, there's some reshuffling. I get it. I don't think it's going to be as inconsistent as it was last year. You still have Evans. You still have Godwin. I really do love Rashad White as a receiver. I think the offense they're going to run, in theory, on paper, fits him. QB 33 seems low. Is that crazy? No, because that means he's not even a starter. It's basically people baking in that he's going to get benched, no pun intended. But I don't think he will. Like, I think he is clearly better than Kyle Trask. Say what you want about Kyle Trask. Like, I. Oh, I have. (laughs) I just, I don't think they would have brought in Baker if they thought that Kyle Trask was anything. I think they will take a look at Trask at some point. And that point is likely if the season becomes lost. If the season becomes a lost cause or they feel like they are not going to have a decent shot to win the division, get to the playoffs, whatever else, they will probably take a look at Trask just to say, yeah, okay, we know what we know and we proved it on the field. Like We have data now during NFL games. Always important for young quarterbacks. And if you're going to move on, you better be sure that you don't have something in him. So that's the point, I think, at which Kyle Trask will play if he plays. Other than that, it's Baker at the at the starting line. Like Baker's going to start for this team, and he is going to trigger a very talented offense. So 33 means you're not even in the top 32 one per team starting quarterbacks. I'll give you low for that. Especially because like you look at the weapons. So Mike Evans has an ADP of 67. That's wide receiver 35. Godwin's going a little bit ahead of that at, at uh, 54 and a half ADP wide receiver 29. Uh-huh. So again, solid like wide receiver threes there, right? Uh, both of them. Rashad White's going as RB 27, so borderline RB2, RB3 territory. Yep. Uh, Kate Otten's going as uh, tight end 35, which is egregiously low, but at least people recognize that Kate Otten exists. You and I have loved him since he was coming out of college. Um but, you know, specifically with the top two receivers and Rashad White, like, those aren't, like, crazy low values. And in my head, I'm like, okay, if you got two wide receiver threes and a, and a running back that's going to be, like, a priority flex guy for most people, somebody's throwing him the ball. Somebody's getting production for all those yards. It's going to be Baker. How are there 32 quarterbacks that you're drafting ahead of Baker? I don't know. Again, I'm not, like, the, the biggest Baker defender, but I feel like if there was something that I'm going pure value hunting on best ball because I'm stacking receivers early yeah. and I'm picking up some value running backs in the mid rounds, maybe I grab a couple tight ends and I'm falling behind on quarterback. You know, I, I miss the boat on the second tier guys and maybe even the third tier guys. And I got to pick up somebody. Yeah. Baker's probably going to be the guy that I pick up in like the last three rounds when I just need another quarterback because, you know, I'm dumb and I stacked a couple bye weeks on QB1 and QB2. <laughs> and he's probably going to give me like 20 plus points with all his weapons. Like, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm crazy. I just I feel like that's wildly undervaluing him. I don't think you're crazy. And we've all done this. You're in a draft and the shiny thing keeps dropping and you're like. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take it if it's there. Yeah. I'm gonna take it if it's there, and it's your favorite receiver. Or your, you know, you're your plucking favorite, JSN, your yeah. favorite team's receiver, whatever it is. And you're like, I know I need a quarterback, but it's there. Okay, I'm taking it. And then the next round comes due, right? And yeah. You're like now I gotta take a quarterback. <laughs> Baker's not a bad bet. These are all weapons that can play. I'm not super high on Kate Otten overall, but he'll contribute. And, you know, Russell Gage isn't even on here as wide receiver three. Mm -hmm. Like, if that's your wide receiver trio, Godwin, Evans, future Hall of Famer, Mike Evans, and Gage, 
there's yards to be gained there. Yeah, you, and, could, you could throw for 4K in 17 games with that. And, you know, if you did the shiny thing strategy, which I'm certainly guilty of, and you got to get a quarterback, you could do a lot worse. Yeah, I don't know. I just I feel like from a value perspective, that's where I'm going with this offense. Like if I'm backed into a corner, so to speak, and I'm like, oh, no, guess I got to take Mike Evans at pick 70. Like I'm going to sleep like a baby because it's Mike Evans. Yeah. But in terms of pure value quarterbacks where I'm hitting here, just because I I think I am a a believer in how all these things fit together system wise, skill set wise, coaching wise. I don't know. I think he's he's way undervalued. And if you guys disagree with me, you know, feel free to take advantage of me in all of these best ball drafts that I'm doing. Or if you happen to agree with me and you want to grab Baker in like the last round for yourself, uh, especially in best ball mania where the prize pool is 15 million dollars this year. So there's a lot of money on the line, a lot of money available. Or if you're just doing private drafts with your friends and they don't listen to this show and you feel like you can take advantage of them. Again, take Baker in the last round. Be your guest. Uh, Promo code bootleg over Underdog Fantasy will match your deposit up to $100. So whatever you put in, they will double it for you and give you up to $100 extra for free to use on the platform for anything. Whether it's, again, leagues with your buddies or Best Ball Mania. Or if you want to go like season long, higher or lowers on Baker. um, Let me look that up right now. That... Might be a good one. If we're if we're value hunting for things we can grab off underdog, and I feel like people might be sleeping on that a little bit. All right. I just looked it up. They they don't have one for Baker right now. They're probably gonna put one in during <laughs> camp once it's like very clear that he's the starter. But right now you can go higher or lower for the season, four and a half rushing touchdowns for Rashad White, seven hundred eighty rushing yards, which again seems do you Very have to do both, or is it no? Whichever or. one, <laughs> whichever oh, wow. one. Uh, Mike Evans higher or lower than six touchdowns and nine fifty, which is about yeah, that's a good line. Right? Uh, Godwin higher or lower five and a half touchdowns or nine twenty five, uh, and then Gage. This one's catnip for you. Higher or lower four hundred seventy five yards for the season. Mm. So again, you can use the extra money you get from the deposit yeah. on on stuff like that if like full leagues are not your thing, or you can do pickums during the season too. So the Rashad White four and a half touchdowns for the year. I I'm taking the over. I'll say that right he might now. get that by like Halloween. Yeah, the <laughs> gauge or seventy five. It really depends on whether or not Baker stays in and stays healthy. But Baker tends to work towards wide receiver three sooner than he works towards te1 yeah so i feel like that's i don't want to say solid i feel like that's something i'd lean towards as well once again thank you to underdog for sponsoring this show as well as sponsoring the entire season and also sponsoring all of next season too and providing very comfy t-shirts and providing very comfortable t-shirts which ej of course is wearing Uh, i get messages all the time by the way it's like brett where do you get the underdog hawaiian shirt yeah not for sale. Limited edition, baby. Limited edition. Check with them. They're not putting it on the store anytime soon. But, you know, maybe uh, if if we perform yeah. well <laughs> enough, uh, we'll ask them if we can, you know, give some Hawaiian shirts away That's to the bootleggers. Right. Uh, with that, though, not to belabor the episode too much, let's get to free agency because even though it was necessary, boy, a lot of names walked out that door this March. It was... A little bit of a fire sale there. Yeah, my note was feels kind of fire sale-y, uh, which is, I guess, a new verb or <laughs> new adjective. Uh, but yeah, we'll just we'll just read the names. Tom Brady, Akeem Hicks, Leonard Fournette, Julio Jones, Cameron Brait, Gio Bernard, Logan Ryan, Donovan Smith, Mike Edwards, uh, Keanu Neal, Shaquille Mason, Sean Murphy Bunting, like so many names on that list that have contributed greatly to the Bucks in recent history on their Super Bowl run and, and before even building up to that, that it is it is necessary. We talked about it at the top of the episode. You've been to the top of the mountain. You have to go down into the valley and reset. This is the resetting personified. Like this is the actuality laid out on paper, black and white. Can't spend all that money. Have to get it back have to take a down year and this is it and that is a tremendous amount of 
sort of institutional experience, snaps, uh, you know, exploits all packaged into one and they're all not bucks anymore. And there's there's really no way around that. And this is just the accounting. And not all of them were cut. Some of them were just contracts that ran out that they chose not to renew. And then, of course, you had Tom Lewis retirement. Um, but the fact that a lot of these guys still remain unsigned, like Logan Ryan's not signed, Geo's not signed, Brait's not signed, Julio uh, is not signed. We're still trying to see if he's even going to play this year because yeah. he's 34. So he's, it's you know it's a it's about that time for Julio. Um, Fournette's not signed. Akeem's not signed. It's a lot of older guys that even even if they wanted them back, uh, which maybe a couple of them for locker room purposes, maybe they did like they just they can't afford older players at this point. Yeah. They really can't. Uh, they they have to build through the draft and get cheap rookie contracts, uh, which they did. And we'll get to the draft like they, they got some really great young talents that we like, but. A lot of these older players that, you know, it's a 32, 33. It's like, I'm not coming back unless I'm getting five million. It's like, sorry, Doug, you're, you're not getting five million. Like when they when they brought back uh, Levante, it's freaking Levante. He's, he's one of the greatest bucks of all time. Yep. Four and a half million. Because that's all they could afford. Yep. You know, Russell Gage, eight and a half was like the big spend for them in the current receiver market. It was eight and a half million on Russell Gage. Jamel Dean. 13 million, which again in the modern corner market is like not that insane. They were doing whatever they could to limit spending. And a lot of these contracts uh were not cuts, by the way. It was, you know, just stuff running out and, and them not not re-upping. And it's it's a lot of older players. A lot of older players that are either at or near retirement age. I mean, Brady obviously was a retirement, but like we'll see what happens with Julio. We'll see what happens with Akeem. But Julio's 34, Akeem's 34. Like it's about that time for them. Brates in his 30s now. He's going to be 32. Uh, even Geo as a running back is 32. Like that's ancient by running yeah. back years. Uh, Logan Ryan, 32. Like it's it's a lot of 30 plus year olds that. Quite frankly, uh, players at that age in the NFL are more expensive, and that's usually when they start to fall off a cliff. So there was no chance in hell they were going to get re-signed by this team anyway, and maybe they won't be signed by anybody because, again, age really sneaks up on you fast in the NFL. But, you know, even guys that that they did bring back, like Levante at, at 33, it's $4.5 million, so it's a very manageable contract in the modern linebacker market. Russell Gage was their big spend at receiver at only eight and a half when like top receivers are getting 30 these days. So, you know, it's less than a third of, of top of market. So that's affordable for them relatively. <laughs> uh, Jamel Dean at 13 million. They brought him back, which again, in the modern corner market, it's more of a value play than anything else. Like they're not, they're not going out to pay top, top, top guys because they can't afford to. That's why they let so many people walk out the front door. Um, and then Nick Leverett, this was a, an interesting value signing for them because he, he's a swing guard. He's not going to be a starter for them this year. But to get a swing guard for less than a million, like this is where the franchise is at right now, where it's like, we can't bring you back unless we're moneyballing this thing because yeah. we, we don't have the money. We spent it two seasons ago and we're... The damage has caught up. We are taking our reset year. Like even their their third party additions, like Baker's four million. Mm -hmm. That's what uh, eight percent of top of market quarterbacks, and he's going to be a starter for them. Yep, it's bargain bin. Matt Filer, starting guard for them this year, two and a half million. Yep. Greg Gaines probably going to be a starting defensive tackle for them, three and a half. Yep. Ryan Neal, one point two. Like we are. Early 2000s Oakland athletics. <laughs> like that's what we're doing here. And unfortunately, it, it was kind of their only option. They got some good players even with that strategy. And I agree with you. They took their ride. They loaded up the wagon for one more shot at this thing. It didn't work out. We talked about all the reasons. Well, many of the reasons that was a reality last year. But when you take a swing and miss... 
this is what you have to do. Mm -hmm. There's no other way around it. That being said, outside of Baker, and say what you will about Baker, and we have Greg Gaines, really good get, three and a half million. We loved his work here in L.A. He's probably going to be, if not a starter, a key reserve and somebody that plays a lot of downs for them and plays well. That's a great get for three and a half. And Ryan Neal at safety, 1.2. They slow played this one. Ryan Neal played better last year as a Seahawk than a lot of people realize, especially people outside that market. He comes in to fill that sort of Jordan Whitehead role that was vacated a year ago. And I think he's going to play really well in that defense. He's His skills fit really well with all the percentages that we talked about earlier in the episode. And again, you wait because you have to, <laughs> right? Your hand is forced, but you're in the second wave or the third wave of free agency. And you're like, hey, there's a guy still available. 1.2, we're going to get him. And he's going to play. He's going to start for them. So it's really important to do well, even if you're not doing flashy. And for the most part, there's a bunch of moves here that are very solid, very strong, but not flashy. Let's flip over to the draft now because we've kind of danced around it mm. <laughs> in various ways for almost an hour now. Uh, very, very strong class. And boy, they needed a strong class because, again, we're, we're talking about value hunting and the financial implications of, of the bed they made a couple years ago when they were trying to run back uh, the Super Bowl squad. They needed to get a bunch of good, cheap, young talent. The draft is the best way to do that. And I think they absolutely crushed it. Solid work. Round one, pick 19. They start off with Kalaja Kansi, defensive tackle from Pittsburgh. Very polarizing player, undersized, extremely quick, good hand usage, natural comparisons to Aaron Donald because Aaron Donald preceded him at Pitt. Um, comes in to give them interior pass rush. Most of the pass rush you're seeing from them is out of their outside linebacker positions. That's where they prioritize that. They wanted a little bit more penetration from their starting three um, to go along with Vita Vea, who can rush the passer, but does it in a different way. They wanted some, some flash to go with their bash, and there was nobody flashier if you're talking about interior pass rush in this entire class than Kalaja Kansi. So, Interested to see how quickly he starts and which which contribution he can bring and the interesting ways that Bulls and Co. are going to move him around to create pressure and mismatches in a way that they couldn't last year because, again, didn't have the horses, couldn't play that scheme. Round two, pick 48, Cody Mock, North Dakota State. They have him listed as a tackle. I think one of the few players in this class that could have played all five offensive line spots and been good really like him even more because of the landing spot. He fits with what they need and what they've been able to utilize. They've gone after, very famously, small school offensive linemen, had great success with them. I think it's a great spot for him. Love him as a player, too. Extremely athletic, moves really well, great demeanor, um, can hit people on the move. Again, that all fits with that shift towards more outside zone just, that we... He's another little Jensen. That we think is coming. <laughs> <laughs> if he turns out to be anywhere near Ryan Jensen, he'll be amazing. Uh, round three, pick 82, Edge Yaya Diaby from Louisville. This is the guy that played opposite Yasir Abdullah, the bigger guy um, in terms of frame, fits more with the guys that they've drafted um, in terms of athletic profile there. I like what he's going to be able to do learning from some of the players they already have mm -hmm. in those roles. Um, you know, I I think it's a really good spot. He was should have been one of our shadow sleepers, uh, but ended up sort of ascending during the draft process and getting picked even before his more productive teammate, uh, largely because of his size. So they skip down. They don't have a round four pick in round five. Pick 153. Servassier Dennis, the linebacker from Pittsburgh. This one was a little early for me, and that's weird to say about a round five pick. Um, some folks were extremely hyped about his potential. I think, again, he lands behind a couple of linebackers, specifically David, that he can look to, and there's probably not a better spot for him to learn, given his skills. When I was tracking the draft... Um, on day three, because I think uh, this was a little bit before I got on. Yeah, but I I still have my draft tracker on my phone. Of right? course, when I was, when I was coming coming here to get coming, on, coming back. Yep. And I was like, here comes Ivan Pace, and then I was like, 
Shirase Dennis. Yeah. It's like, I mean, I get it, but also like, did Ivan Pace kill somebody? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, is there a, a more Todd Bowles linebacker than Ivan Pace? <laughs> yeah, the, that when I say a little early, it was there were still players on the board that I would have picked for this scheme before him. Do I like him? I think he's really interesting. He was not talked about a ton. I dug into him late. Um, and he ended up getting drafted late, so that kind of worked out. But um, outstanding person, great leader, very productive at Pitt, played in a bunch of different roles for them. He was not pigeonholed in terms of what they did with him. Um, so there's a lot of potential there. It just felt like, again, there were some players I liked on the board better. So when I say early, that's a strange thing to say for a guy that got picked in round five, but just felt a little bit that way to me. Round five, pick 171. They come back and get Payne Durham, the tight end out of Purdue, who we actually saw at Shrine Bowl. I liked him a lot. I thought he's got a lot of potential. They add him to a very young, what is now a very young tight end room uh, with a lot of room to develop. But I thought he showed me more in the process earlier than some folks that got picked above him. So a little bit of hope for you there, Tampa Bay fans. Uh, round six, pick 181, only 10 picks later. Cornerback Josh Hayes out of Kansas State, one of the players I didn't get a chance to watch. I spent a lot of time watching his teammate, Julius Brents, who got drafted a lot earlier. Who, by the way, goes by Juju now. I saw that. I, I was looking at the Colts uh -huh. roster because I was I was working on the Colts agenda. I was like, Juju Brent, is that oh, okay. Yep. I'm switching guys names. Will, yeah. Guys will do that. <laughs> guys will guys will change it up. Uh and then also in round six. So they went, this is this is crazy. They went 153. 171, 181, 191. <laughs> At pick 191, they get wide receiver Trey Palmer out of Nebraska, the speedster. Uh, I really feel like he's going to replace Scotty Miller's role as mm -hmm. the deep seam ripper, and I like him for that role. I think he's going to be good um, and might see a few targets um, maybe next year more than this year uh, when they get somebody. Baker's still got a pretty good arm, but Trey Palmer is an absolute missile down the stripes. So. If they really want to take advantage of that, they're going to have to get somebody with a cannon. Uh, also in round six, again, only five picks later, they go from 191 to 196, and they get one of your favorites in the entire draft, Edge, Jose Ramirez from Eastern Michigan. I cannot believe he made it to 196. I loved Jose. Uh, him learning under Shaq is perfect because they, they win in a lot of the same ways, like more with technique and versatility and because you know jose is, a, is an older prospect maybe that's a little bit of the reason why he fell but like you go back and you watch his sacks and he, he led d1 in sacks uh last year and he won in every kind of way like speed to power um he won outside he won inside he won with quickness like he's he's got such a big toolbox and learning from Shaq, who is another guy who wins less with physical gifts and more so with his toolbox of moves, uh, that's that's huge for Jose. It's a great spot for him. So overall, really strong draft. Only a couple of huh picks for me. And they weren't like, oh, my God, I can't believe they picked that guy. And again, they were later picks. Every other pick I can see a path of playing time. I can see a fit with scheme like the overall potential. It's a good haul. It's a bunch of guys, which they needed since we talked about all those free agency losses. They needed to reload the roster. This does it and then some. Uh, looking at uh, the players they got after Jose, uh, meaning after the draft, you know, all of the, the UDFAs, they had a pretty large UDFA haul overall with a few guys that we do think have a chance to either make the practice squad or possibly sneak onto the final 53 um, and we'll see just because this roster overall doesn't have a lot of depth like the starting 22 I think is it can hold up but the depth is not ideal so there are jobs <laughs> to be had here uh, Sean Tucker out of Syracuse the only reason he didn't go he didn't get drafted is because of medical you know his there's a lot there uh, and, and from what we were told in the, during the pre-draft process, there were some teams that were just like, absolutely not. Like yeah. I'm not, not even wasting time Don't on it. it. Uh, but he is talented when he is healthy. Uh, and so hopefully he can stick around in Tampa. Cause I, I think as an RB three for them, again, health permitting, love that for them. Uh, Rakeem Jarrett out of Maryland, I think has a shot here, uh, to at least be on the practice squad. 
Uh, Cade Warner out of Kansas State is one that you highlighted. I did not get to him. I watched like 40 receivers, but he was not one of them. Uh, Jeremy Banks out of Tennessee, I think has a legit shot to make it just on special teams. Uh, and maybe he can work his way into linebacker rotation in the future. But if if he's going to make the 53, it'll be on special teams. Um, and then uh, Kayvon Merriweather uh, out of Iowa. We do love our hard-hitting Big Ten safeties down in Tampa. Really, any safety that hits hard is is. is yeah, it doesn't matter if they play in the Big Ten or not. <laughs> uh, and then, see, the last one that you highlighted, was, is it Christian Izian? Is that how it's pronounced? It is. And we saw him at Shrine Bowl, again, a very rocked up, hard hitting safety. If you're sensing a theme here, it's because there is one. <laughs> um, Cade Warner, I highlighted because of his parentage. That's Kurt's son. Wait, like quarterback Kurt Warner? Quarterback Kurt Warner is now old enough to have a kid in the NFL. Really? Oh, my God, I am old. Yeah. Jesus. Well, you remember that by the time <laughs> Kurt Warner hit the NFL, he was not a spring chicken. I did. I did not, huh? Wow. Okay, I'm just aging by the second I right now. Just, I that blew my mind. Yep, watching the dust come off you. Uh, I should talk. Sean Tucker, <laughs> I loved was one of my ten gems on offense. Uh, really, really enjoy his game. The medical red flag was difficult. Some teams had him, as you said, completely off the board on talent and tape alone if he clears the medicals, which, of course, is the most important thing in terms of long-term health. He can be he could be RB2 for them. He is mm-hmm. easily that talented. Um, and Rakeem Jarrett was a guy that I was surprised didn't get drafted because of his versatility. Small, extremely tough, better in a receiving role, I think, in his – highlight moments than going undrafted and has special teams versatility did have a very high drop rate he's gonna have to clean that up but the fact that he can start on special teams which is where he's gonna need to make a name for himself as a udfa gives him a leg up to making this roster and he could absolutely be a wide receiver four or five in the future again if you plan on special teams, that means you can be five. If not, <laughs> you're going to have to be four. But his talent um, when he catches the ball is extreme. He can dust some folks. So very excited to see whether or not he can round out his game and eventually contribute to Tampa's primary offense. All of that now brings us to our final two segments here. Uh, report card and then the win total ceiling and floor which is kind of a range of projections for possible win totals they could have, uh, which I I assure you our numbers are different than maybe people expect. (laughs) But we're going to start with our report card where we're grading four different categories, front office, coaching staff, offense, and defense. Offense and defense more referring to talent than coaches. And they can get one of three different grades, either up, down, or even. And even is not a negative. Even is even. Uh, Starting with front office, we're going even there. Stable, steady as she goes. Uh, we knew going into this offseason what it was going to be. We knew what the task was. Uh, we knew financially the position they were in, and they handled it as well as they possibly could have. We'll see what this draft turns into on paper. We like it. But overall, we just asked them to not hit the iceberg, and they didn't hit the iceberg. They're realistic about it. They had an approach that they had to have. It was pragmatic. We knew it was coming. If they didn't win another Super Bowl and repeat, this bloodletting was going to happen. It happened in a pretty solid way. They still came in on the back end of free agency, got some value. We like the fact that they had a what looks to be a solid draft and got some extra talent in UDFA. Like They did everything they could. It may not be your favorite thing as a Bucks fan, but it was necessary and they did a good job of it. For coaching, uh, we're also going to go even there. Uh, again, we mentioned kind of the lack of, at least apparent lack of cohesion uh, in the staff last year. They've made some minor changes over the last couple of years. You know, Byron, you know, getting let go last year was was the biggest one. But overall, most of the staff is still there, and uh, and we still believe in them individually as coaches. We just we want to. I just want to feel like everybody's kind of on the same page this year. That's that's really what I hope to see. Um, offensive talent can't be anything other than down. You're going from Tom Brady to Baker Mayfield here. 
Yeah, and they've retained a lot of other very good talent. But if you don't have somebody triggering that talent, we've seen, I would say, at best, very mediocre results in the NFL. I think that's probably what we're going to see again. Again, if everything comes together and it clicks and they all buy into the coaching, they have enough talent there to reel off a bunch of wins. Got to see more unity from the entire program, from the coaches to the players to the scheme. And we didn't even see it last year with Tom and his sort of legendary ability to get everybody on the same page. The best they could do was a losing record. Yes, the offensive line is going to be better, but you're still losing Tom. And defense, finally, we're going with even there as well, because largely it's it's the same unit they've had the last few years. There, there's some minor shuffling here and there. Um, a few additions, a few losses. You know, I, I think nickel is is a little bit of an issue for them. Um, but like the rest of like their outside corners are just a bunch of big dudes that beat people up. Their safety core is good. Uh, Levante as of now is still a very good linebacker, even at 33, you know, the interior defensive line is as talented as ever. Um, the edge rotation, if Tryon Shrinka turns into what we think he can be, should be fine. Like Yaya, I, I think is super explosive and, and, you know, maybe could, could fill a gap that um, they haven't had since uh, in terms of just like big, powerful edge rushers, JPP in 2020. I think they, I think they're drafting Yaya to be like their new JPP of just somebody who can just fucking manhandle somebody. Um, I, I would say there's potential for this unit to go up, yeah, but we're playing it safe and going even for now. That's where I'm at. My my needle is just almost ticking towards the positive because there is it's sort of like dripping with potential and they have invested so much here. And you mentioned Tryon Schoenke. He went off at the end of last year. Like, again, nobody was watching the Bucks down the stretch. Everybody knew that even if they made the playoffs, which they eventually did, they were going to be an easy out. He really came on. So he's a, just one more sort of tick in the column of this defense could be really good really quickly. And they continue to invest there. And if there's going to be something that pulls this team out of the muck and mire, it's it's going to be the defense. So looking at it from like a, a top down view, you have an eight and nine ball club that barely was eight and nine made it as hard as possible on themselves to be eight and nine. And it's even, even, down, even. That means this team's probably going to lose more than nine games this year. That being said, looking at ceiling and floor, my ceiling for this year is the same ceiling they hit last year, which is eight. And that's if everything goes well, if they stay healthy, if Baker plays well, like they're they're gonna be mid again, and I think Bucks fans would be a, well, no, they wouldn't be okay with that because they want Caleb, <laughs> but a particular Bucks fan I know wants Caleb. <laughs> Hi, Hi, Trevor. Trev. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, I, I think there's a lot of Bucks fans that are expecting them to win like two games, and if they hit eight, they'd be like, oh, that's kind of a pleasant surprise. That is literally my top, top, top ceiling. Like the heavens would have to smile upon them to get to eight. The more realistic scenario is something six or under, and my floor for them, just because I think the defense is good, uh, is is three. Whether or not three wins is enough to get Caleb and secure title contention for ideally 10 to 15 years, if he is what we think he is, uh, we'll see. Like maybe maybe three is the bottom of the NFL, um, but I do think that halfway through the year, if they're sitting at like two wins, there's gonna be a lot of Bucks fans that are like, "Please God, put in Kyle Trask." Yeah. <laughs> Kyle Trask <laughs> experiment will begin immediately. My ceiling is eight, um, same as yours. I think that they match last year's win total by doing it a completely different way. Uh, but they end up at the same overall place, which is maxed out at just under 500. Floor, four, it's one more than yours. It's just because Baker will be Baker, and that may be problematic for them if they are cruising to a very low finish. Um, they may remove him from the lineup to say, 
look, we don't need any late season heroics and we know you're not going to shut it down. So Kyle Trask, it is. And, you know, again, that's not a purposeful tank. It's this is a team that at best is going to be in the middle. And one of the major reasons that we haven't talked about till now is the rest of the division got a lot better. Mm -hmm. And so those games are all going to be harder than they were for this team last year. So, again, they may end up at the same rank, but they're going to do it a completely different way. It's a fascinating team uh, overall. And again, I want to emphasize to Bucks fans, I am interested in watching Bucks games this year. Uh, this year, I should say. Uh, now, it might be like a morbid fascination, but I am fascinated by this team. I, I don't think that they're going to be like unwatchable bad. Um, and I do think that there's a lot of good players that I do genuinely enjoy studying on this team. Um, but expectations should be realistic. And if there is ever a fan base in the NFL that is realistic about their win totals, it's probably probably Bucks fans. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, it was fun. I, I think that they're. Um, God, what's a nice way of getting out of here with <laughs> burn the ships, burn the ships. <laughs> uh, all right. We'll be back tomorrow with our NFC South predictions where. Uh, we will we will try to be nice to the Bucks again. Uh, can't make any any great promises there, but we are attempting to be diplomatic with this series. We're not trying to take away your hope in July. Nope. Uh, but yeah, we'll be back again tomorrow with NFC South predictions where we're picking division winner. We're picking rookies of the year on both sides of the ball. We're picking offensive defensive player on both sides of the ball, uh, and we're, and we're kind of going over uh, key additions and losses. For every single team as a whole, if you don't have time to watch the deep dives on the other teams in the NFC South. So Bucks fans, if you're new here, join us for that. And then, of course, uh, join us during the season as well, where we promise we will not ignore you if you're bad. I know that, uh, you know, network TV will not talk about the Bucks this year. We will. I can promise you that because we talk about every team, whether they're bad or not. So uh, come back for that, too. Uh, all right, EJ. Let's go get ready for him. Time to go. Time to go.